Alrighty, everybody, I just got our okay to start our planetarium show, so I'm going to be putting away our space trivia questions and that important message up on screen, because now we're going to be heading into the unknown. Ooh. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome to the Morrison Planetarium. Really quickly, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Christian. I want to be your planetarium presenter for this afternoon. And I'm not just a voice coming out of the walls. I'm actually a person, and I'm standing right behind you. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> Don't hurt your necks. Look forward into the dome before you. That's where the whole show is going to be. I just want to let you know that I'm an actual person and not a robot. And uh, also, everything that you see in purple right now is going to be one enormous screen. Thanks to help us six different projectors hidden throughout our planetarium dome. If you're looking for those projector systems, they're hidden just below that purple glow. And folks, I'm very excited to have y'all here for the last Planetarium show of the day because this is different from all the other shows that we've done here so far. This one is called Tour of the Universe, and it's absolutely my favorite to do because this show is completely live. You're going to hear my voice for the next 30 minutes. And pretty much what this show entails, well, we're going to be starting off pretty close to the Earth, and we're going to be zooming all the way out to the very edge of the observable universe. So hopefully by the end of the show, you won't have an existential crisis of where we are in space. But uh, just a heads up, we're pretty small in the grand scheme of things, so just need to forewarn you. And before we get started with our show, I do have to go over some quick house rules just so that we're all on the same page and have an enjoyable time. There's a few of us in here. First off, there's no food or drinks allowed in. If you manage to bring any snacks, make sure those are put away to the end of the show. Also, if you um, have any cell phones, smartwatches, anything that produces really bright white light or loud sound, now is the time to turn them off, put them away for the next 30 minutes as these could be very distracting and takes away from the Planetarium Show experience. Also, if you need to exit early during our show, you're more than welcome to do so. All we ask is that you exit towards the top of the planetarium. That's where the exits are going to be before, during, and afterwards. So always make your way up the stairs. And if you have trouble climbing the stairs, don't worry. Once the show's over, we'll have a staff member escort you to a lower exit once the show wraps up. So just remain seated for a little bit longer. And last but not least, folks, this show is quite immersive thanks to our 75-foot dome above us. If at any point during the show you start to feel overwhelmed, you start to experience motion sensitivity, there's a really quick and easy trick to ground yourself. All you have to do is close your eyes, take a few big deep breaths, then your brain will remember that you're sitting in a planetarium in San Francisco and not hurtling across the universe, at least not more than the usual. Hee hee hee. But with that being said, it looks like we're ready to go. So I invite y'all to sit back, relax, gaze into the dome before you, because now we're going to get started with our tour of the universe. And let me just regain control here. And now, folks we can see that we're pretty much starting off right in front of this spacecraft in front of us called the International Space Station or the ISS. We can all see the city lights down below, so the Earth is just right below it. And folks, a lot of people tend to ask me, hey Christian, what is the International Space Station? I tend to hear about it all the time in news and articles, but I don't really know what it is. Could you explain it for me? Well, of course, folks, the International Space Station is a research facility, a laboratory that orbits around our planet Earth, and they conduct all sorts of science experiments uh, that they're unable to do closer to the Earth, which has a lot more gravity. So some of the things that they'll conduct up here are experiments like what happens when you try to grow plants in space? Do the plants grow the same? Do they grow differently? Which way do the roots grow? Another one is something like what happens when you try to grow uh, or what happens when you spark a match in space? Does the flame act the same? Does that act differently with less gravity? And one of my favorites is where they had two identical twins. One twin lived on Earth for a year. The other one lived on the International Space Station for a year. After that year, they uh, compare and contrast it. Turns out when you live in space for a long period of time, you tend to age a little bit slower. But not only that, you also lose a lot of muscle because you don't have gravity constantly working down on your muscles, at least not as much. So if you plan to live in space for a long period of time, remember to exercise daily. And folks, the International Space Station looks enormous here in our planetarium dome, but it's not that big in actuality. It's only about the size of an American football field. If you've never been to an American football game, don't worry, you can also use the entire California Academy of Sciences, the museum we're sitting in. That's about how big it is. 
And also what's really impressive is that this spacecraft is going incredibly fast. It's going a whopping 17,000 miles per hour where it orbits once around the Earth every 90 minutes and it experiences 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets a day. Whew, how romantic. <laughs> And also, folks, uh, this thing looks really far away from our planet, but it's not too far either. It's only about 225 miles above the surface of planet Earth. 225 miles? That's like going from San Francisco to Santa Barbara, a nice little road trip to get, get away with the family for the weekend, so not too bad. But to be honest with you folks, this is as far as we put humans out into outer space nowadays, just because traveling into space is very expensive. <laughs> You have to build yourself a rocket ship or buy yourself one, and then once you get your hands on that, you have to account for so much rocket fuel. You're gonna need so much rocket fuel, you gotta be able to escape the Earth's gravity. Once you acquire that, you have to also account for all the food, water, all the air you're gonna be breathing while you're up here in space, so the bill gets quite costly quite rapidly. But folks, the International Space Station is just the first stop on our tour of the universe, so now we're gonna see it slowly disappear. And before we lose track of it down to the city lights, I want to add a nice little orbital path so we can see it before it disappears and it becomes out of sight. And now as we're zooming out, we're going to get a larger view of where we are on planet Earth. We're just hovering above India right now. But now we can see the entire Earth in its entirety. And I want to let you know, folks, that the space program that I'm using here in the Morrison Planetarium is something that you can go home and download if you want to fly through space just like how I am. The space program that we're using here is called Open Space. So if you go to your favorite search engine, type in Open Space Project, you'll come across the link where you can download it, and then you can fly through the space just like how I am. But just a heads up, Open Space is not entirely finished. Uh, we may come across a few bugs and glitches. If we do, I'll point them out. Hopefully we can look past them. Um, also, Open Space uses a whole lot of processing power. So if you have an older computer, I wouldn't recommend downloading it. It pulls from geo satellites in orbit, so it needs a lot of processing power and information. So uh, if you got something new, give it a try. It's a whole lot of fun. But also, um, if you're not a tech savvy person like how I am, or how I'm not, I'm not tech savvy at all, um, we also have another great alternative called NASA's Eyes. So if you go to your favorite search engine, type in NASA's Eyes, just like the human eyeball, you'll come across a link. Don't have to download anything. You can fly through space, and it's so much fun. So Open Space Project and NASA's Eyes. But now that we've got a good sense of what we're using in here, let's make our way over to our nearest natural neighbor to us in space, the moon. And folks, we humans have been to the moon before, but that was a little while ago. That was between 1969 and 1972, thanks to NASA's six Apollo space missions that brought a total of 12 incredibly lucky guys to walk on the surface of the moon. They got to conduct science. Uh, they also had some fun up here as well. They got to play some golf. But again, last time we sent humans to the moon was 1972, a little more than 50 years ago or so. But don't worry, folks. NASA has a new space mission in the works that's going to be sending humans to the moon in the next few years. This new space mission is called Artemis. Pretty much with Artemis, NASA wants to send humans to Mars. But before we send humans deep into our solar system, we got to figure out exactly how we're going to be living out here in space. So the moon is the perfect stepping stone to figuring out the logistics of how we'll be doing that. And what's even more incredible is that NASA is going to be sending the first woman to the moon. But not only that, they're also going to be sending the first person of color to the moon. But not only that, they're also going to be setting up lunar bases throughout the moon. Pretty much our technology has greatly improved in the last 50 years, and we're able to conduct a lot more science in a much more compactable size. And one place that we definitely want to set up a lunar base is the south pole of the moon. The reason why is because we found a whole lot of ice there, and ice is going to be very helpful for setting up bases because you can pass an elect electric current through it, separate that, uh, separate the hydrogen and the oxygen, and both of those are very useful, especially when you're out here in space. 
But again, look out for any news about Artemis in the coming years because we humans should be heading back to the moon relatively soon. And folks, when we look at the moon here from planet Earth, sometimes the moon feels incredibly close to us. It feels like you can reach out your arms and touch it. But the moon's about 240,000 miles away from the Earth, a quarter of a million miles. Some of the adults in this room may have a car with that many miles on it. If you, and if you take better care of your car than I do, you can even imagine it, uh, driving to the moon if you drove for about four months nonstop, going about 80 miles per hour. Although I wouldn't recommend it, the roads out here are poorly maintained. <laughs> and from here on now, folks, we're going to need to use a more useful measuring stick because at this scale, using miles is kind of like using inches to describe the distances between cities because space is so big. Astronomers use a more convenient measurement known as light speed, and light travels at a mind-boggling speed of 187,000 miles per second. That's roughly about 300,000 kilometers per second. So while it took the astronauts more than three days to reach the moon, traveling faster and farther than any human has done so or since, it only takes light one and a half seconds to cross that distance at the speed of light. That's kind of like a short pause in conversation. But at last, folks, it's time for us to leave the moon behind. So everybody say bye-bye, moon. We'll see you later. And now, folks, we're going to be stepping into another uh, larger realm of our solar system because now we're going to watch the moon and the Earth and its orbits as they start to slowly recede. In fact, before we lose track of our moon, I want to add some nice planet trails because, again, space is so big, you can easily lose stuff out here in space. And on our journey today, folks, we're going to be traveling much faster than the speed of light. We're going to be traveling at the speed of the human imagination. Thanks to the help of computer models like Open Space, show us the most accurate images and information available to us. And now the nearest star to us, the sun, is coming into view. So uh, here comes the sun. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Got him. And now we can see our sun, folks. And also, our sun is incredibly far away from us as well. It's about 93 million miles away from the Earth. Whew, 93 million miles. That's a great distance away. But in terms of speed of light, that's not too far away. Again, we're the third rock from the sun. So one, two, three, that's us. 93 million miles between us. In order for sunlight to travel that distance, it only takes sunlight about eight and a half minutes at the speed of light. Only eight and a half minutes. Not too bad. But now that we have a nice bird's eye uh, view perspective of our solar system, let's get a quick refresh of what's in the solar system, shall we? Lots of good stuff here. Right in the middle, we have our star, the sun, the biggest thing. Closest planet to the sun, we have Mercury. After that, we've got Venus. And of course, Earth, that's us right over there. And after Earth, we have Mars, the red planet. These are all the rocky terrestrial planets that we can actually land a spacecraft on. And then past the orbit of Mars, we have this really cool thing called the main asteroid belt. And this is what it would look like if I highlight all the asteroids. There is a lot of them. And then past the asteroid belt, we have the really big planets, the gas giants, the Jovians. We have Jupiter, the largest of them all. Then we have uh, Saturn, famous for its rings. And then after those, we have our icy gas giants. We've got Uranus, the funny one, and of course, Neptune. And of course, we can always add everyone's favorite and lovable dwarf planet, Pluto. So here, here comes the orbit of Pluto on screen on the left-hand side. And a lot of people don't realize that Pluto hangs out here in this outer part of our solar system called the Kuiper Belt. And you're probably wondering, what's the Kuiper Belt? I've never heard of that before. Well, folks, this is going to be the Kuiper Belt. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff out here in the outer part of our solar system. Mm -hmm. So this is past the orbit of Neptune, and uh, mostly we're going to find out here in the Kuiper Belt region are icy asteroids and short period comets, comets that don't stray too far away from the sun. And pretty much we came across the Kuiper Belt in 2006 because our space telescopes became a much more powerful. We we're able to see much smaller objects much further away. Who knows in the next 10 to 15 years as our telescopes improve, what else we'll find in our own backyard in our solar system. Very exciting. But I want to put away the Kuiper Belt because that's just a whole lot to look at. And now I'm going to be adding on screen some of the many different spacecrafts we sent down in the 1970s to explore our solar system. So on screen now we have the 
the trajectories of Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1, and Voyager 2, and the latest of them all, New Horizons, which did a quick flyby of Pluto in 2015. We can see that interaction just over there. And, I'll, and just to let you know, all these spacecrafts are traveling fast enough to escape the sun's gravity and leave our solar system behind. But even the most distant of these robot adventurers, Voyager 1, has not traveled as far as light travels in a single day. In order for sunlight to travel all the way out to the orbit of Pluto, it takes sunlight about five hours at the speed of light. Five hours, not too bad. But folks, let's leave our planetary scale behind us because now we're going to be heading into interstellar space, the space between the stars. Distance now becomes so immense, it's going to take us about four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, the Alpha Centauri system. Alrighty, folks, so Alpha Centauri is the next star system closest to us, so we're right smack in the middle. Closest star system is right over here on the left-hand side. We can see it moving. And again, four years at the speed of light just to reach the next star system to us, but that doesn't really put into perspective of how long it would take us humans to travel that distance. Well, folks, if you're getting a spacecraft today, left planet Earth, make your way over to Alpha Centauri. It's going to take you about 8,500 years to cross that distance. Whew, and that's just a one-way trip. But let's stop and consider whether humanity has made its presence known beyond our solar system, because now we're going to be stepping inside something called the radiosphere. Once again, folks, we're now inside something called the radiosphere, and this represents the current limits of the most distant radio signals humanity has ever broadcasted, or rather leaked into space. And it extends about 90 light years in all directions emitting out from the Earth. This first began in the early 1930s with strong radio waves, early television, radar signal, and then later, the detonation of atomic weapons. All this stuff is emitting electromagnetic radiation strong enough to escape the Earth's ionosphere. And humans were broadcasting well before that, but the earliest radio was not quite powerful enough to escape the Earth. And since all these signals are electromagnetic, they are traveling at the speed of light, so this is kind of like humanity's electromagnetic footprint in the universe. And of course, the radio sphere is always expanding at the rate of one light year per year, so is anybody out there listening? And right now, folks, I'm going to be adding some many markers onto the screen. These markers indicate some of the many thousands of stars astronomers have discovered over the last 30 years, which has at least one or more planets orbiting around them. We call these planets exoplanets, and we're looking for any of them that are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it. So far today, we found close to 5,000 exoplanets in the nearby vicinity to us, 5,000 other worlds besides our own. And that 5,000 number is going to be increasing as the years can continue because we have space telescopes where the whole purpose is to find as many exoplanets as possible. Now, to say if any of them are Earth-like with conditions suitable for life as we know it, well, we can't answer that question quite yet. Pretty much new space telescopes are being developed, created right now, so it's going to be a few years before those are launched into space and then uh, we'll be able to answer that question. So we've got a little while before we can tackle that question. But the more important point here is that quite a few of these planetary systems are within that 90 light year limit of our radio sphere and could have potentially received our signals. However, since radio waves travel at the speed of light, if there is anybody that's out there able to listen in and answer back, the communication delays between hellos could be decades in time. Now, to give you an example, let's say we live in a star system inside our radio sphere on the left hand side. Let's pick uh, this one right over here. We find an alien civilization somewhere towards the middle, let's say 60 light years from us. We shoot them a text message. We say, hey, we're Earthlings. We live here. It takes 60 years to get to them. They listen in, answer back another 60 years. Folks, that is a 120-year conversation in the making. Whew. And I could barely wait for a text message from my friend. <laughs> And of course, planetary systems beyond the radio sphere, more than 90 light years away, have not heard from us yet, but eventually they will, as the radio sphere is always growing, but it becomes weaker as it does. But for now, folks, I'm going to be putting away our exoplanet markers. 
and I want to leave our radius sphere up on screen. Because as huge as humanity's electromagnetic footprint is, it is nothing compared to our Milky Way galaxy. So keep your eyes on that radius sphere. Alrighty, folks, we're now looking down our entire Milky Way galaxy, the galaxy that we live in. And I've got to ask, can anybody see their house from here? <laughs> Just kidding, we're way too far away. And folks, our Milky Way galaxy is incredibly large. If you wanted to cross it from one side to the other, it's going to take you about 130,000 years at the speed of light. This thing is enormous. And not only that, our Milky Way galaxy is so huge, we estimate that there's at least 300 billion stars in our galaxy. If our recent discovery of so many exoplanets just within our small neighborhood within this vast star city is any indication, there could be billions of planets and potentially millions of Earth-like planets throughout our single galaxy. And before we leave our Milky Way galaxy, I want to show you what it looks like from a sideways perspective. You're going to notice that we live in a pretty flat spiral disk. Kind of looks like a big pancake in space. One, you've probably heard someone say, hey, look, you can see the Milky Way from here when you're looking up in the night sky. What they're referring to is the plane of that Milky Way galaxy that we live in. That's what you see up in the night sky. So it's this big flat part with all this stuff. And this is very important because when astronomers and scientists want to learn about the universe, it's so much more easier for them to point their telescopes galactically north and galactically south. Instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way, which has planets, stars, gas, debris, things that block their view of the universe. So keep that in mind, we like to point our telescopes and scientific equipments galactically north and south. That's going to come important in just a little bit. But folks, the Milky Way galaxy, galaxy is only one of many hundreds of billions of galaxies that comprise the known universe. So in this giant leap, every single point of light that you're now going to see no longer represents a star, but rather the location of an individual galaxy. Each galaxy containing hundreds of billions, perhaps trillions of stars. Now, we live in a local galaxy group of galaxies, which contains about 30 galaxies, large and small also includes the nearest large spiral to us, the Andromeda Galaxy, only 2 million light years away, just next door and heading right for us. We're going to get to know it pretty intimately in about 5 billion years, so mark your calendars. And as we continue zooming out, folks, you're now going to realize that galaxies are not evenly distributed throughout space. Instead, galaxies like to clump together in large groups and clusters, or they like to avoid each other where there's very few galaxies or no galaxies at all. We can see a nice galaxy cluster on, right over here on the right-hand side. We can see more galaxy clustering towards the bottom right there. And we can see very few galaxies or no galaxies toward the top of the dome of, of just above us. You can kind of think of galaxies like people. They like to hang out together, or they like to avoid each other. And folks, we've zoomed so far out now that the picture that we're looking at represents the closest 30,000 galaxies to us over a space 300 million light years across. we got to give thanks to an amazing researcher by the name of Dr. Brent Tolley, who worked at the University of Hawaii, who compiled this amazing representation thanks to the work of other astronomers working beside him over decades of time. So big shout out to Dr. Brent Tolley. I love flying through this galactic map. But we no longer... Uh, we now have automated systems that are mapping even the most distant galaxies. So folks, we're now about to see the very large scale structure of the universe. And remember folks, every single point of light that you're seeing, that's not a star, that's an individual galaxy. And just a heads up, folks, the large-scale structure of the universe is not in the shape of a bow tie or a butterfly as we swing on around. Remember when I mentioned that we live in the flat spiral disk of our Milky Way galaxy? Well, if you're to line up our Milky Way, it would line up just down the middle like so. So again, we like to point our telescopes galactically north and galactically south instead of looking through the plane of the Milky Way because all that stuff blocks our view of the universe. But scientists still want to make sure that there was galaxies through the plane. So we have this nice purple survey of galaxies right over here. You'll notice that they were still able to find galaxies, just not as many and not as far. 
pretty much we have to wait for our technology to improve. And once that happens, we'll be able to map in all this area that hasn't been filled in yet. So it's just a matter of time. But it looks like we're running drastically low on our tour of the universe, folks, and we still have a little ways to go. So let's continue pressing on because now we're going to be encountering these really distant, far away objects known as the quasars, which are these orange dots at the very edge of the large scale structure of the universe. So we can see some quasars on the left, some quasars on the right. And quasars are short for quasi-stellar radio sources. These blazing objects are all billions of light years away. So now we're looking so far back in the depth of time and space that the most distant quasars represent the universe at a much earlier age. We're nearing the very beginning of galaxy formation. In other words, with the quasars, we're viewing a sort of awkward, gawky teenage version of the universe. And before there was a teenager, there was a baby. So let's press back to a time before quasars, before planets, stars, and even galaxies began to form. Folks, we're about to see the very edge of the observable universe. Alrighty, folks, here we are at the very edge of the observable universe, and what we're looking at is something called the Cosmic Microwave Background Image, or the CMB image for short. And all evidence indicates in the universe that we live in is about 13.8 billion years old. And this is data compiled by Planck and other radio telescopes. And the picture that we're looking at is a very baby version of the universe, only 380,000 years after the Big Bang occurred, where space and time began. And this isn't a typical photo either. Instead, this is a temperature density image where the light echoes of the Big Bang are color-coded with the lighter areas corresponding to the hottest, least dense regions and the darker areas, the coolest, densest regions. These fluctuations in temperature and density are extremely, extremely tiny. They vary no more than one part per 100,000. But these really minute differences eventually gave rise to that large-scale structure of the universe that we saw moments ago, that clumping and clustering of galaxies everywhere. Figuring out just how that happened is one of the larger challenges for cosmological research today. Though our view here is of the outer edge of the known universe, folks, the earliest light visible to us, that radiation actually persists all around us. It permeates the universe, stretching and cooling as the universe expands over billions of years of time. But folks, we only have one direction left to go, and that's going to be back to planet Earth because uh, we've traveled as far back as the law of physics can physically allow us to go. So let's find a nice entry point through all these quasars and galaxies. And this looks like a good spot. And let's make our return trip back to planet Earth, y'all. Alrighty, everybody, we're crossing an expanse of over 13 billion light years. We present you with this view of our universe and the latest in cosmological and astronomical information. We're covering eons and observing objects billions of light years apart. And we live in a golden age of astronomy with new generations of telescopes and spacecrafts that are extending the reaches of our eyes, preparing for the eventual race between the advancement of technology and the accelerating expansion of the universe. With that thought, I'll remind you all that astronomy is for everyone. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to enjoy the beauties and wonders of our universe. All you need is the night sky, and if you can, get away from the lights of our cities and look up. Even a good pair of binoculars makes for a decent first telescope, and there's astronomy clubs all around the world that invite people just like you to look through their telescopes and peer into the great beyond, allowing you to partake in the wonders that our universe has to offer. Now, astronomy as a hobby can offer an endless supply of satisfaction, and I do hope you'll join us, those who dream amongst the stars. But hey, look at that. We made our way back into our Milky Way galaxy. We're heading straight for that radiosphere. And of course, we're making our way to our own little neighborhood out here in space, our solar system. And we're now entering our star system, folks, passing the spacecrafts we sent down in the 1970s to explore our solar system, passing the orbit of Pluto and the Kuiper Belt, and making our way to the third rock from the sun, our homeworld, planet Earth. All the people that we know, love, ever learned about in history all resided on this one planet. 
And now we're about to pass the orbit of the moon, the furthest we've ever sent humans out into outer space. And as we make our final approach back to planet Earth, this is going to be the end of our tour of the universe show, folks. And I want to thank y'all for stopping by and watching it with me today. I hope you did enjoy it. But hey, look at that. We made it back safe and sound back to planet Earth. And that's all for today, folks. Thanks for stopping by and get home safe.